All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, good evening, and welcome to your monthly business mentorship program, Time with the Captains, live here on TV3. The program affords university students an opportunity to interact and engage with captains of industries, business leaders, and entrepreneurs. And tonight on the program, we've got another special guest here. Also, our audience constitutes students from the University of Ghana Business School. We've also got students from the Ghana Institute of Journalism, as well as students from the GH Media School. My name is Parkus Yassari. We're streaming live on Facebook. We're live on TV3. You can join us if you've got questions or suggestions to make on this program. Uh, we're live and interactive on Facebook, on Twitter. Our handle is TV3GH. We'll take a short break. When we return, I'll introduce our guest for the month of May. Come on, let's go. Hi, welcome back to Time with the Captains, your monthly business mentorship program live here on TV3. My name is Parkus Yassar. We're streaming live on Facebook. We're also live on TV3. So who is our guest for the month of May? So our um, captain for the month of May holds the position of chairman for Golden Beach Hotels Limited. You give that one up. Okay. He's also chairman of the Roman Ridge School as well as a council member at the University College of Agriculture and Environment. Uh, just correct me if I go, uh, anything has changed. He also serves on the board of seven other companies. In the past, he occupied the position of chairman council at the Ghana Stock Exchange and chairman council at the Ghana uh, Security is an exchange uh, securities depository company limited that's a subsidiary of the ghana stock exchange in 2018 he won the prestigious african bank of the year awards and was uh, also in addition inducted into the african ceo's hall of fame for his sterling role in the banking industry he received an undergraduate degree and an mba from the university of ghana ladies and gentlemen join me welcome the managing director and director at cow bank limited mr frank edu jr Ms. Edu, Genio, thank you very much for your time and good to have you on time with the captains. Thank you for having me. But before we go, let me make a correction. Why? If you say that I serve on seven other boards, bot, bot, mm. I'll get into trouble with the central bank. Seven other companies? I'll get into trouble because the central bank says that I can't serve on more than five boards. So you've relinquished and some of them? of them, yes. Okay, okay. So how many do you serve on now? <laughs> <laughs> um, Roma Rich School. Um, College of Humanities Focus. Focus is a um, hospital. Okay. It's actually, that one is actually, um, you don't get paid to sit on that board. You know, you paid to sit on that board you, because we help. Um, we help take care of um, children with complex spine conditions, right. hunchbacks, things like that. All right. Then Cal Bank and one or two others. Right. In 2018, you were voted the African Bank of the Year and also inducted into the African Seas Hall of, CEO's Hall of Fame for your sterling uh, role in the banking industry. How did that feel? I guess uh, being human, um, once you're recognized, um, you feel good. You get a warm feeling inside of you, you know, and then you wonder what it is that you did that some people thought they should give you that recognition. Mm -hmm. But what it also means is that um, whatever you're doing, know that some, somebody is watching. You know, so if you're doing anything, you have, you have to give up your best at all times because you never know who is watching. When it I came went, as a surprise to mm, me. Yeah. When I went out sampling the views of people about the name Frank Edigenio, the popular opinion out there is that he's a no-nonsense man. Why do people see you as such? Don't I look like a kitten? <laughs> Do I look like I had a fly? You don't look it. No, I, you know, I was brought up by um, a Presbyterian disciplinarian father. So, and I went to a Presbyterian school. So it was, it was all about discipline, you know. So I guess um, if you like to keep things in order, that they would say um, you're no nonsense, which also means that I'll not make a very good politician. Mm. Mm. They tolerate nonsense? <laughs> um, you know, I don't want to be called to the Privileges Committee of Parliament, <laughs> you know, but I think to be a politician, you've got to be you've a, got to man compromise. Of, a man of many, many skills. Mm. I don't think I have those, those skills. Mm. You know. How long have you served at Cal Bank? Too long. How many years? 
<laughs> you know, one of those people that you call an educated person. So I joined CalBank in March 1990. Okay. <laughs> um, I joined, they gave me a title. Um, they called me a senior analyst. Okay. And um, Right from school? Okay, so right from business school, yes. I, um, when I came out of business school, I had four options. I had Unilever. I had GNPC. And I had Ecobank. And a bank then called Continental Acceptances Limited. Mouth-watering deals and offers. Yeah, so, and I chose, um, to the chagrin and annoyance of my dad, my father, I chose Continental Acceptances Limited. Which is now Cal Bank. Which is now, which became Cal Merchant Bank and is now Cal Bank. So I was employed as a senior analyst, and then um, I guess, in 1993, or 93, yes, I was made treasurer. And then 99, I was made deputy managing director. And 2000, I was made managing director. Mm. So 10 years, and then I was given the hot, hot job. Mm. In 2000, you were made managing director, and something quite significant happened. Not in 2000. In 2000, what's... What happened of significance was I turned 38 years old. <laughs> I was born in 1962. So. There was an extraordinary <laughs> general meeting that was held, broadcast telecast live on television. You were to be removed as the then managing director. That was 2008. It was um, 5th June 2008. What happened? Um, at the time, I had gone to the annual general meeting earlier on in the year, I think in April, um, or thereabouts, to increase the state capital of the bank from what it was then, I don't remember the figure, but to 200 million US dollars, which basically had been arranged, you know. So um, raising, the, raising the money wasn't the problem but securing the support of shareholders was the problem, was what was going to be a challenge. And, um, well, you know, in, in, in our part of the, of, of the world, or in what we do, it's a very unforgiving world, and promises are broken, minds can be changed overnight. I don't want to go to the detail of it. Maybe when I write my memoirs, I will, <laughs> I will go into the detail. Mm. Suffice it to say that, um, the um, resolution was shut down at the AGM. So subsequently, um, a shareholder called an AGM and basically to ask for me to be fired for being um, ambitious and reckless. Uh, long story short, the the action the, that corporate action failed. There was a poll. What it means is that there was a vote. There was a, we went to the polls, like we vote for the president. And luckily, the majority of shareholders thought that I must, I must keep my job. You were positively ambitious. Ambition is good. Greed is bad. <laughs> so you haven't regretted at all, have you? At all. Like, can you imagine if you had done that um, 11 years ago? We won't be part of the of what went on last year about trying to get to 400 million CDs because that was 200 million dollars. You know. How on earth did you not find yourself into trouble? How on earth could you have run a bank for so long and not been in the bad books of the central bank as other banks did? How on earth could you have been so prim and proper with your books? Uh, like I said, I mean, I, I was brought up by a very um, disciplined father. So up until the age of 10, your formative years, you will not spare the rod if you misbehaved. So you learned how to behave yourself at all times. It was not because Frank Edu was politically connected or had so much influence and so couldn't be touched? I don't think I have any influence at all. I have no 
foot in any party. I hold no party card. You know, I exercise my franchise, I vote, but I, I don't play a political game. Now, you didn't seem to have hassled at all in raising that 400 million seated capital. That is another story. But, I mean, we had the money. We didn't have to go to external sources. We just had to transfer from income surplus to stated capital for as long as we were making profits. And that's what we did. Would you call yourself a businessman, a CEO, an entrepreneur? What would you call yourself? I like to call myself a teacher. You know, I, I, my <laughs> colleagues call me teacher. Mm. <laughs> teacher, do. That's what they call me. They okay. Me. Was awful. Some of them call me that because when in a, in a meeting, in, in a presentation, basically you have to. Don't forget my first job when I came out of school was a TA. So I was a TA at Legon for two years. And I wanted to be a, be a lecturer. But um, I had a difference of opinion with my, my head of department and instantaneously wrote a one-liner and retire, resigned. I never went back. So You get angry quickly? No, I don't. <laughs> The guy gave me a reference that I was a third class student when I was a third class student. How is that possible? Because that is what he chose to do. <laughs> What's wrong with being a third class student? Because I wasn't a third class student. What student were you? I got an upper. I missed the first, but I got the first. You said you were a third class student? Yes. So, you know, I was going to do my master's, and you know, the forms come, and the forms come from the school, it was McGill University which is a very good school in Canada. And it's um, top 5%, top 10, top, 10, top 15, etc. And for everything, apart from the ability to read, write, and understand English, he put me in the top 15, which basically said, yeah, third class. But then at the bottom, he said, but the student managed an upper at the end of the year. <laughs> so I read it, I tore it up, I resigned. And that was it, I didn't go back. What's your definition of leadership? You know, I, I don't know, I haven't read any of those leadership books, but I, maybe you should ask my <laughs> colleagues. I haven't read any leadership book. I, I think that for me, you've got to treat people right. You know, you have to be fair to your, your colleagues and um, treat them right and respect them. And I think once you do that, they will accept you as a leader. And it's not out of fear, but it's out of the fact that they respect the position you hold and they respect you as a person and then the rest becomes quite easy. Right, you're still watching Time of the Captains, your monthly business mentorship program live here on TV3. Our guest for the month of May is Mr. Frank Eddie Jr., who is the managing director and a director at Cal Bank uh, Limited. I've got students uh, who constitute our audience for the night. Uh, we've got students from the University of Ghana Business School, from the Ghana Institute of Journalism, as well as uh, students from GH Media School. If you've got any questions, kindly raise your hands, and then I will obviously get you to ask your question. Who's got the first question? You mention your name and where you're coming from, and you ask your question. Pass the microphone over to her. My, I'm Sophia Hajide, a student, a final year student at GH Media School. And Mr. Frank, my question is, what do you make of the current- Did you say Mr. Frank? Mr. Edu. You can either call me Frank or you call me Mr. Edu, but you can't okay. say Mr. Frank. Mr. Edu, please, what do you make of the current banking sector reforms? Like, I mean the drastic reduction in commercial banks from 36 to 23. You want to take that or we take a next question? Okay, let's take a response. You want me to take it? Yeah, let's take it. Um, there is no optimum number for banks in the economy. Okay, so... Um, South Africa has maybe now five. Um, the U.S., people don't know, but they have about 3,000 banks. There are banks which serve communities, basically just serve holy roads, you know. And so the number of banks is not the issue for me. The issue is whether it's a solid enough banking sector. So you can have three banks, and it will be the banks will be well capitalized and strong enough to serve the needs, the total needs of the economy. And you could have 35 banks and they would not do that. They wouldn't be able to do that. Now, this um, governor elected to consolidate banks and reduce the number to make them stronger and therefore also recapitalize the banks. And I think any, any, any move like that under 
all circumstances is good. Because banks are the strength of banks determined by the capital that they hold. And that capital can disappear very, very quickly. Um, so even the, the, the reforms as I see them, the reduction in the numbers first step is good because the banks now become smaller. And then to make them stronger, it says recapitalize to 400 million. There's a lot of noise about it, but it's a good number as well. But that is not, that is not the end of it because the number 400 would be adequate today, but based on the risks that you go and take, mm. could easily become inadequate. So there's a ratio that. called the capital adequacy ratio, which up until the beginning of this year was ten, minimum 10%. At the beginning of this year, they've added a buffer of three, so it goes to 13. Now, if at the time that you recapitalize, your capital adequacy ratio was 20, but based on the risk that you go and take by September, it's come down to 12. You start the risk of being penalized because the buffer is 13. When you go below 13, you begin to get warnings. When you go below 10, then what happened to other banks is what begins to happen to you. Advisors are appointed, managers are appointed, you lose your licenses, etc. So all in all, it's a, good, it's a good move, but the central bank will now have to watch the risk appetite of the various banks. And that is where I think the challenge is because we also have a high default culture in this country. And every time you make a loan and you don't get paid back, your capital is impinged. And that, that, that ratio suffers. Mm. All right. Next question. OK, my name is Cynthia Incom, and I'm a, from GH Media Square final year student. So my question is, uh, Mr. Du, how do you become the MD of uh, Cal Bank? How did I become the MD? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So these, first and foremost, why did they even employ me? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I, like I said, I joined the bank in 1990. In the year 2000, 10 years later, I was 38 years old when I was made MD. You know, so maybe I was doing something right. Because there were, there were other people there. There were people who were senior to me, etc. You know, I don't know. You have to ask the people who gave me the job. <laughs> Next question. Hello, my name is Benis Obey from GH Media School. My question is, um, I actually thought Carbank was a multinational company. It was quite surprising knowing it's an indigenous one. So I want to know, what would you say is the reason why most businesses in Ghana do not survive over 10 years? Is that a fact? <laughs> when you ask me questions, be careful, because you must, you must, otherwise you get into trouble. Is that a fact? Yes. Really? You've done the research. Yes. Most businesses don't last more than 10 years. Yes. Or they don't survive the first generation. <laughs> <laughs> eh? Both. Yes. You know, listen, I'm not going to blame Guinean businessmen. It is a very tough terrain to do business, this country is. You know, you have high a very high interest rate regime. You have so about 70, 80% of business whether I like it or not, originates from government. Government is the largest employer. You know, so there's so many exogenous factors which work against a businessman. You know. Then, of course, the biggest canker of all is corruption. You know, so, I mean, you have clients who repeatedly get, I have to choose my words correctly. Um, I'm not blessed with the gift of diplomacy. So let me ponder a while. And you have customers, clients, who depend repeatedly on public agencies for contracts. If they tell you what they go through to get those contracts, and then when it comes to payments, what they have to go through to get their certificates signed and paid, now you couple that with the amount of interest that they are paying to the banks, and I ask them, why do you do this business? Mm. Because you can see, up initial, that you're not going to make a 5% return. And if there's a little delay, you're going to go into serious financial problems. But they'll tell you, Master, we have to work. You know? So you see, you see clients with the best of will working very hard. Um, 
And after a while, it is, the, the companies won't survive. And it's true, most of them don't go, even go up to 10 years. You know? So it's, I think that the general environment, with the best will of any government, and I don't think any president or government comes to power with that intention to kill the economy. They all come to power with an intention to do something good. But the, I, don't, I think there's, uh, the whole structure of our economy makes it very, very difficult for people to succeed in business. But then the other thing is, I think also, you know, we probably should be focusing on doing small things. I know a lot of people like me will talk about becoming like a Google or why can't you become like a, a Samsung and we are two totally different milieus, you know. You, can, you, can, you have to look at the resources you have and say, after all, this country became the largest producer of cocoa without the cocoa plantation. There's no cocoa plantation. You, t there are very few 100 acre cocoa farms in Ghana. Most of them average the one, one acre, two acres. And yet, it became the biggest producer of cocoa. So there's something there that, that we must potentially explore. Indonesia is one of the biggest producers of rice in the world. They don't have rice plantations. They have one acre lots behind their houses like that, you know? And we have the population which can do that. You know, but if you begin to set up a business thinking so very big as when you go to all these motivational speakers will tell you to think. <laughs> you understand me? That, that's what you're going to have. Your, 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 um, they will speak tongues. What are they called? Pastors. Your pastors, <laughs> your prophets, your motivational speakers. That's what they tell everybody, you know, and everybody thinks that's, that's the way to go. So people come. They have very little equity, and they want to tell that. If you take to tell that to set up a business, you will be enslaved for the rest of your life. I can guarantee you, if you don't have equity, you have equity in your business, and it's all debt or too much debt, your business will not survive. You will not make money. You will work for the bank. You will die poor. <laughs> you must save. You must have equity, which you will leverage with, with acceptable debt. But most people don't do that. So. Be, by the time they start that business, that business is doomed to fail. Because, again, the environment in which the business is set up itself is very harsh. You know? So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but we must, we must, we must not um, um, give up. Because it's people like you, businessmen, businesswomen, small entrepreneurs, you will build up and build the economy, it's not government. Well, what's your biggest challenge as a leader? Human resource. Tell me about it. You know, <laughs> um, banking is a very difficult business. So you take on a lot of risk. I give you a loan. We agree that you are going to do X, Y, Z with it. I go my merry way. You go your merry way. The next thing I see is that you've gone and bought yourself a few cars and flying girls all over the place, you know, and then you default. Even when you don't want to default, some people will, will fully and willingly default. Meanwhile, you've made a loan and you can't sleep. So uh, there's also a lot of uh, temptation, etc. So you've got to get human resource who have character, who are disciplined, who are principled, who have skills. The last one is skills you can teach. Um, so we have, Carl Bank, we have a resource center, a 24-bed uh, hostel. Um, and we can put you there for two weeks. The last set of graduate trainees we took on, um, we put in training for a whole year. You're if, paying them, taking care yes, of them? Yes, because you, you've got to get the right set of people. We started with, I don't know, 100, we whittled down to 40. And the last day, we selected 30 and let 10 go. And um, the way we did it was that we let, they voted themselves off. Oh. So we said, OK, now, because from the beginning, we made them understand that we're taking 40. But the last day, it says, we're actually taking 30. Now vote 10 off. Now, if you don't vote, then you're automatically off. Half of them threw up. But it was their last coaching 
the ability to take ruthless decisions when they have to. You know, so that is, that is what that was supposed to do. And, but the point is that because human resource is so key and it's so, it's in, so, it's in large, large supply, but unfortunately, unfortunately, and I do not mean to um, criticize any of you, unfortunately, the quality is very poor. And I don't blame them. When I was in Legon, has it got to do with academic quality? No, it's, I think it's got to do yes, academic quality and the training that you get in second in, 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 in universities. So when I was in Legon, my um, um, my class was um, the the uh, the the what the teacher assistant teach? What was that class called? The tutorial class. Yeah. We're eight. Okay? We're eight. Today, a tutorial class, and when I was teaching, my tutorial class was like 120. So, you see, it becomes very difficult for you to actually give quality education. Okay? So, what it is is when you employ these people, you can't blame them. You've, you've got to teach them, you've got to coach them and train them before you give them the risk. The, the responsibility of handling people's resources. Because like I said, banking, you can lose, the risks are so high, you can lose the resources very, very quickly. So the biggest challenge for, for us has always been who to employ. You know, and then fast forward, let's all agree that um, principles, morality, character in the past 30 years have been debased dramatically. Um, a lot of students come, and there's actually a report, a research done, it said 40% of all new graduates who go into banks, cashiering jobs in shops, etc., go with an intention of defrauding the institution. So there's a lot of, and yes, and now, I mean, there's a lot of fraud in the banks every day. Now, the West, the West is the cyber regime which we've entered, mm. you know, and it's the young ones who have these cyber skills. And if you make a mistake, uh, I think in, um, on, in Friday's paper or so, um, the cybercrime unit said last year the banks lost $120 million to cybercrime. I think that number is understated. Wow. There's a lot more to it. It's more than that. Mm. All right, uh, you're still watching uh, Time with the Captains, your monthly business mentorship program live here on TV3. Our guest for the month of May is the managing director of Cal Bank, Mr. Frank Edugino. We're going to take a short break. When we return, I'd ask him about his thoughts on failure, whether or not he's had any failures in his life, and what we need to do uh, as young people to become successful business leaders and entrepreneurs. We'll be back shortly. All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You're welcome back to your monthly business mentorship program, Time with the Captains, live here on TV3. My guest for the month of May is Mr. Frank Edugino, who's the managing director of Cal Bank and also a director there. Uh, so before we went on the break, I asked you, have you ever failed in life? Of course. You should fail. <laughs> you should fail? Of course you should fail. What's your biggest failure? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't let it... I don't let... Failure really worry me. I mean, you fail, so what? You get up and go. You don't care about failure? You know, the only failure is if you fall down, you don't get up. You understand me? So you, you get up and move on. I mean, if you don't do anything, you don't achieve anything. So, um, I don't know. I tried to be a pilot. It didn't work. I, <laughs> all kinds of things. So what? <laughs> but you should accept failure, you know, and I'm a, I'm a very, I'm an avid sportsman. And I think that one of the things that sports does for you if you play sports at very high levels is that is you accept the fact that you will lose a game. As many games as you win, you will also lose a game. And if you lose a game, so life goes on. I mean, Are you a high risk taker? I am a um, calculated, considered risk taker. What does that mean? It means that you, I am not averse to risk, but I am not reckless when it comes to taking a risk. Let me tell you something. I mean, right now, at my age, 
if you show me a business opportunity, I don't look at how much money I will potentially make from the transaction if I did it. I would look at how much money I would lose if the transaction doesn't go as planned. And if I can afford to lose that money, I will now look at how much the transaction would make if it succeeds. If I can't afford to lose that much, I say thank you very much. You can keep your pot of gold. That is a considered risk taker. There are many people who, all the people who are scammed, when they see a transaction, they show their transaction, they only see dollars and CDs and, and um, you know, nice things. They become tunnel vision or they become like a blanket horse and they don't see any of the risks associated with, with that particular transaction. And you call it greed? That is greed. That's not good. That will kill you. So aside managing cow bank so successfully, have you ever tried to venture into any business to yeah. see how good you are? Yeah, I have. What have you done? <laughs> you know, in the days of the revolution, my father came to my part of the house and I had two bedrooms and I had used one bedroom as a storeroom and I'd gone out and he, this is, I'm talking 81, this is revolution and he entered the, I don't know how he found the key and when I got back home, he says, what's that, you know? So it was like a warehouse and this is a time when there was nothing, but I managed to get anything and everything to sell. <laughs> I was um, 19 years old. I started um, when I was 12. My father made me go work. Okay, so from the day of, t from, the, from, from 12 years old, I've made money. From 12 years? Yes, so by the age of 15, I could give money at home. And by the age of 15, from the age of 15 onwards, I never asked my father for pocket money. It's as simple as that. You know, I, you, th there's one thing that everybody has, which God gave to everybody. It's called gray matter. You know what gray matter is? It's a brain. So God gave everybody a brain. You know, so let anybody take whatever you have from you, but nobody takes your brain. And once you have your brain, you can always use it. If you use it, if you decide to engage it properly, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of failure or losing your job or anything like that. What business has a banker got to do with managing a school? I don't manage a school. <laughs> I sit on the board of a school. I think not two different <laughs> things. I don't, I don't, there's, there's a whole management team. Mm. You know, there's a board of governors, academic board of governors, which is chaired by the venerable um, Joyce Ayi. Um, then there's the, the chief of Abondo Chrome is on that board as well. Patrick Iwa used to be on it, but he got too busy. Um, and then there's the, the business board, which I chair. And that's myself, um, Noto Mabo, um, the GCNet chairman. Um, Gordon Gopal, the school administrator. The founding headmaster from England, um, Jeffrey Allen. And then Joyce Ayi again. Mm. So we handle the business side, and then Joyce Ayi and co handle the, the academic side. And it's been pretty, pretty. Been very good. Well, how many years now? So, um, so about 17, 17 years, I think. Well. It's an interesting story, but I, that's also come out in my memoirs. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Any more questions? And after you, I'm going to ask a gentleman to ask the question. I'm Your name? Salome Lai, a mm. final year student of GH Media School. Please, is education really all what we need to succeed? Education right. is it really all we need to succeed. All right, thank you. How would you define success? success? When you make it to the top. 
you okay. achieve your goal, what you really okay, want. So I, I think that there is a historical basis to this question. People like my father who took, who took over the civil service after the white man left in 1957 were made to believe that he had to get a, an education to get a white collar job. And that basically makes you a civil servant and you always draw a salary. But today, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they've all said that you do not need an education to work with us. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go to school, because it's education, you know, no, they say you do not need a university degree to work with us, but you need an education. So it depends on what you want to educate yourself in. Are you going to hire me without um, formal education? Why not? If you, show, if you show proficiency in what I want you to do, I mean, how many of the, the people who do the coding have been to university? You yes, understand I me? Mean. Or what has an university degree in sociology got to do with robotics? So that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, in the past, we were conditioned to come out of school and go work for a multinational or go work for government. Otherwise, you became a nurse, a teacher, a doctor. <laughs> One of the biggest mistakes Kwame Nkrumah made when we got independence was to make um, a, a, a classics professor the first, first vice chancellor of the University of Ghana. When you want to go, when you want to go industrialize, why do you want to go? I did classics for my, as, as a minor. Why do you want to put some, somebody who did classics like me in charge of an university where you want to produce people who would change the fortunes of your industrial economy? So the University of Ghana started off by producing people like me, geographers. My first degree was in geography. Geographers, sociologists, as well as so. And today we continue by, when you go to any university master's program, Half the class will be doing HR. Nobody mm. is doing STEM. Mm. But STEM is what you need to, to develop your, um, your, your country. Even your agri so-called agri universities are not basically focusing too much on it. Now, are you going to tell me that um, the venerable and very respected um, chief imam is not educated? He's highly educated. But he's not in the sense of what you're thinking about, right? That he's a highly educated man. So you need education, but you don't necessarily need to go and read any of these humanities or any of these various courses that the universities are running. Um, what you need to do is educate yourself in what will make you relevant to society and help you achieve what it is that you want to achieve. Next question, a gentleman. Quickly. Uh, I'm Kekeli, GH Media School, level 100. Um, Mr. Edu, we are told you are retiring soon. Does that make you feel sad? Why? Because business... Why, why would I feel sad? Oh, maybe you retiring, you might. Because you, I can see you are in love with the work, and then, yeah. Okay, so retiring right. might, yeah, right. that's or, fair. yeah, it may be very difficult for you. Okay, yeah. you answer that. I'm looking forward to retiring. Why? 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 Yes. Why? Yes, please. You see, <laughs> I I don't know whether you heard this response before. Let me repeat it. Um, I'm Gemini. My my horoscope is Gemini. Gemini, we are two two people. Okay, so I have two sides. I have the very formal side, and I have the very, um, what did I say, silly side. <laughs> I've been forced for the past 30, almost 30 years to do the formal side. Now I'm going to break my shackles and go and do the silly side for the next 30 years. So the first thing I'll do when I, come, when I, when I leave Cowbank is that I'll wear an earring. <laughs> We're looking forward to Unfortunately, that. Unfortunately, I don't have hair to do dreadlocks. <laughs> Next question. Um, please. My name is Zainab Tiwa Smart. I'm from the Ghana Institute of Journalism. Please, I have two questions for you. Yeah, Apart from being a disciplined person, how do you get the inspiration to do the things you do? And also, when you're not working or buried in your books, what do you do to unwind and then relax? The second one is very easy. 
so if I'm not working or sleeping, I'm playing a sport or reading. Okay? So in a, in me, I read anything and everything, whether it's whatever it is I read. Um, motivation. What inspires you to do the things you do? Um, for me, it is just about self, um, I would say, achievement and, I, and challenging myself. You know, I don't seek to please anybody ever. And I, I think people should understand that, that the minute you begin to want to please people, you're going to get, you're going to get confused. You know, you know, because everybody expects something different of you. So you decide that this is what you want to do. As long as it is not illegal, you are not harming anybody, you are not stealing from anybody, you go ahead and do it. And the other thing I've come to realize is that, and people think it's only a Ghanaian thing. It's, maybe, it's not only a Ghanaian thing, but maybe it's more of an African thing. Is that um, in most parts of the undeveloped world, maybe because of um, poverty cut, which cuts across various, many communities, people don't like to see other people succeed. That for some people is very demoralizing because they will backbite you, the proverbial, proverbial pull you down, but understand something. Anytime people want to pull you down, understand that you're doing something right. So that should actually motivate you and you should continue doing what you're doing. Right. Now, I, I retire in December. My colleagues threatened to give me a send-off send party, which I do not want to attend, because I know I'll be emotional. But I may not have a choice. So I've been working on, my, on, on the things I'll say on that day. And one of the people, that, well, the people I'll thank the most are the people who tried as much as possible to make sure I failed. <laughs> because as much as they tried, the more motivated and determined I became. What's your biggest legacy as you retire? To Carl Bank. Yeah. My biggest legacy, most people think I would say that that head of his building, no. That is only a structure. My biggest legacy is I hope would be the impact, my impact on the young men and women at Carbag and hope that I made them better people than, than they were when they joined um, the bank. Please put your hands together for him. It's been a very interesting discussion. It's already one hour. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Students from the University of Ghana Business School, from the Ghana Institute of Journalism, as well as students from GH Media. This has been another exciting edition of your favorite program, Time with the Captains, live here on TV3. Immense appreciation to the managing director and also director at Cal Bank, Mr. Frank Eddie Jr. We thank you so much for uh, taking time of your busy schedule to join us for the show. Actually, I've, I've enjoyed myself more than they have. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to my producers, to the cameramen, to the directors, all of you out there. I want to say a big thank you to you. Unfortunately, we're unable to read your messages. Lots of them that came in, we're unable to read them. Hopefully next month, we'll join you with another edition of your favorite program, Time with the Captains, here on TV3. Bye-bye. <laughs>